Despite the fact that the particular value of elasticity changes as we move along a straight line demand curve, we still can say that approximately a more elastic demand curve or a demand curve with higher elasticity, a bigger number for elasticity of demand, corresponds to what we call a shallower or a flatter demand curve. And we can see here we have two examples, one with a smaller elasticity of demand and one with a larger elasticity of demand. Now we can think about this really in terms of literal elasticity. Think about our percent change in price as a particular force that's being put on a rubber band. If the rubber band is very elastic, it stretches a lot. If it's very inelastic, that same force causes it to only stretch a little bit. Similarly, we can think about our inelastic demand when we apply this force of a particular change in price, we only get a little bit of a response in terms of the change in quantity demanded. On the other hand, when we have our more elastic demand curve, or our higher elasticity of demand, when we apply that same force, that same percentage change in price, we get a correspondingly larger change in quantity. And this correspondingly larger absolute change in quantity also corresponds to a larger percentage change in quantity. So basically what you want to take from this is the bigger a number you get for elasticity of demand, the flatter your demand curve looks. You can also remember this because inelastic starts with an I and the more inelastic demand kind of looks like an I. It's a little helpful thing for you to remember. We can also think about what demand would look like in very extreme situations. On one extreme, you have what we call completely or perfectly inelastic demand. And that's demand where the elasticity is always zero, or in other words, the change in quantity is also equal to zero. Because here, no matter how much we change the price, our quantity demanded never changes. On the other hand, we could have what we call completely or perfectly elastic demand. Here, our elasticity of demand is infinite. In this case, even an infinitesimally small change in price causes our quantity here to go from very, very, very large to zero. So you can think about these as the two extremes. If a company were to face completely inelastic demand for their product, they'd be very lucky. A company facing this type of demand would only be able to sell a product at one price or sell nothing at all. These are sort of theoretical constructs that don't happen very much in nature, but we can think of them as the limiting cases of what we just talked about in terms of inelastic versus elastic. In general, we group situations into one of three categories. If the elasticity of demand is greater than one, we say that a situation is elastic. If the elasticity of demand is less than one, then it's inelastic. And if the elasticity of demand is exactly equal to one, then we refer to that particular scenario as unit elastic. We can talk about a number of general rules regarding elasticity. The first rule is that necessities tend to have more inelastic demand than luxuries. So we can start putting up these different scenarios in either the less elastic or the more elastic category. We don't mean to say overall whether something in an absolute sense is elastic or inelastic, just relatively between two cases, which one is more likely to have higher elasticity of demand. So let's come back to the necessities versus luxuries rule. We say, well, something's a necessity, you know, food, shelter, clothing, even not even taking that literally, we're not likely to change our behavior a whole lot if the price of that item changes. So that's going to be in a less elastic category. And then over here, items that are considered luxuries, you know, they're nice to have, but we don't really need them, they're going to go over here in the more elastic category, because if their price changes around a whole lot, we're just going to say, eh, I didn't really need it that badly, and we're going to change our behavior. The second rule regarding elasticity is that goods that have more close substitutes are going to have a higher elasticity of demand, 
or in other words, be more elastic. So now we have on this side products that have more close substitutes. Because if there are a lot of substitutes for a product and the price changes a whole lot, well, I'm just going to go and buy something else that's basically equivalent instead. If a product has fewer close substitutes, well, I'm kind of stuck. There's nothing for me to switch away to that's going to make me as happy in the same way. So that price can change around a whole lot and I'm not going to be able to change my behavior. The third rule is that consumers tend to be more inelastic with their demands when something consists of a very small share of that consumer's budget. That doesn't necessarily mean a low price, but just in the grand scheme of things, you don't consume enough of it for it to really matter. Say you have $3,000 worth of income every month. Well, if you're considering the elasticity for something that you might spend a dollar a month on, the price could double, triple, etc. And it's not really going to affect your consumption behavior that much. So over here, you say when something comprises a smaller share of your budget, you're going to act in a more inelastic manner. And if something consists of a larger share of your budget, you're going to be more price conscious and exhibit higher elasticity. To really highlight the point that smaller share of budget doesn't necessarily correspond to a low price, consider the example of the spice saffron. Now saffron is the most expensive spice, you get a tiny little vial of it for you know, six or seven dollars that just has a few sprigs. It's, it's very, very expensive in absolute terms. However, people don't generally use very much of it at one time. You can take one little pinch of it and put it in an entire thing of rice and flavor the rice. So even though on a per pound basis it's a very expensive spice, you use so little of it that it comprises typically a very small share of budget. In that way, the price could probably double, triple, and so on, and you wouldn't see that much of a change in behavior. On the other hand, you could have something that on a per unit basis is very cheap. You can think about, for example, diapers for a small child, where any individual diaper isn't that expensive, but mothers and fathers use so many of them that they actually comprise a fairly large share of the budget. So in that case, the diapers are more likely to be price sensitive for the consumer than the saffron. The time frame that we're considering also has an effect on elasticity. If we're considering a shorter time horizon, we'll generally see less elastic demand because we don't really have a lot of opportunity to change our consumption behavior. For example, consider thinking about the demand for gasoline over the next two weeks versus the demand for gasoline over the next six months. Well, over the next two weeks, you're stuck at whatever job you have, you're stuck with whatever car you have, and you probably aren't that able to change your behavior based on prices. On the other hand, if you're considering over the next six months, there's a lot more that you can do to switch away from using the gasoline. So when you think about a, lar a longer time horizon, you're going to be more price sensitive and thus have a higher elasticity of demand. The last rule is that the more broadly you define a particular good, the lower elasticity you're going to see. And that's not entirely unrelated from this point about the close substitutes, because for example, if you're thinking about demand for a Ford Focus, well that's a pretty narrowly defined good, it's easy to switch away from a Ford Focus to something basically equivalent, I don't know, the Nissan Sentra, Chevy Cavalier, whatever, and you're going to see a higher price elasticity than if you were considering the market for cars overall. Because while it's easy to switch from a Ford Focus to a different type of car, it's much more difficult to substitute away from cars entirely. So you would see the demand for cars looking more like this, and the demand for the Ford Focus specifically looking more like this.